Hello and welcome back. I'm Terry Burns and this is a continuation of my class on the Monas Hieroglyphica or Hieroglyphic Monad of Dr. John D. We're up to Theorem 7 today, having gone through the letter to Maximilian, the letter to Printer Silvius and the first six theorems. So let me share my screen here and we will get going. Of course, if you're here at this point, you know what the Monas Hieroglyphica is, who John D. is, and something about the context. Before we talk about magical flux today, which is the subject of Theorem 7, I just want to remind you that in these earlier videos, we focused on the contexts implied by things, especially by the letter to Maximilian, cosmogenic texts like Plato's Timaeus, which will be a, a real central point today, the Sefer Yetzirah, Hermetic, as opposed to Rabbinic Kabbalah, and the Bible, especially Genesis and Revelation. So please look at those videos first. And if you look at nothing else before this one, please watch the video on Theorem 6, because Theorem 7 depends a lot upon Theorem 6. Okay. Um, you know that D is taking apart this symbol, his monas symbol, his hermetic symbol of everything, and putting it back together by explaining it mathematically, magically, cabalistically, and anagogically. And you know what he means by that, of course. Let me give you uh, just a quick review of theorem six, just to remind you some of the things that we talked about there. We talked about terms like ternary, quaternary, uh, octad, septenary, as referring to certain groups of numbers. So ternary is not a ternary, it's not Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but it's the ternaries of different cosmogenic texts that are his context. When we're looking at it in terms of Hermetic Kabbalah, it might be the Supernals, it might, you know, Kether, Hokma, Bina. Here in the Timaeus, it will refer to three things. The ternary referred to in his monad glyph has parts of this cross, this line, this line, that's one, two, and the dot in the middle is three. The quaternary uh, represented, if you drop out this little intersection point here, these four lines. Going over this also gives us a good chance to remind you the kind of visualization flips that D is gonna ask you to do all the way through here. Remember, a monad as a cosmogenic symbol is just this circle with a dot, and the circle represents a sphere. So when we were talking about this quad rectilinear cross, which is D's cross of the elements, as we will see, you're going to flip these right angles that are in the center out, so you have a square. Then you flip the square into three dimensions, and, and you have a cube. Then you have this hidden octad because of the many properties of a cube, which we talked about last time. Then you are left with this dot, which was displaced, and it's in the center, and it's the septenary. And from that, we referred it to various acts of things that happened in Plato's Timaeus, which is, after all, the Pythagorean cosmogenic text, where the universe is formed by pure form. So we also talked about that earlier in our context video, but for theorem seven, as with theorem six, it is going to be much more of a context, even than Genesis, which was the main context, context for theorems one through five. So you could say that if D is describing this anagogically, and we remember that, oh, uh, in the late Middle Ages, anagogy was a type of scriptural exegesis that is focusing on the highest level. And in Gnosticism, it is like the Gnostic ascent of the one or to the monad being the one. In Neoplatonic Christian thought, it would be a return to the good, or it might be um, what is presaged in Revelation. Okay, here though, the main anagogical scripture is Plato's Timaeus. So it is basically a restoration of the concept of the good, that highest value in Neoplatonism. So D's ternary, we talked about what is represented by those lines and the dot in the middle in D's monad. And it is three things about the creation story of the Pythagorean wise craftsman, that that craftsman first creates this world, an unchanging world of eternal forms, that that is the world of being where everything is perfect. 
from that perfect eternal world of forms, we get the world that is in a constant state of motion, the world of becoming. And that world of becoming uses the world of forms as its model. That is the reason why contemplating perfect forms, if you are into ancient Greek mathematics, and Dee is the preeminent expert on that in his time, why contemplating forms the ancient Greek way is such a sacred act. So that's one and two of the ternary. The third thing is the receptacle, the kind of, you could almost think of it as like a magical seal, but what exactly the receptacle is, as I discussed in my last video, has been talked about, about almost ad infinitum by philosophers and literary scholars over the last 2000 years, but it basically it receives the images of this world of perfect forms and from it creates the world of becoming, the world that's constantly in motion. So if you are a scholar a grad or a grad student aspiring to be a scholar, you can look at all of that critical writing about the receptacle. All I'm going to do here is say that his ternary is one, two, three, our eternal world of forms, the world of being, the world that is constantly changing, the world of the universe, um, the world of becoming, and then the receptacle that mediates between the two of them. His quaternary, those four lines when you displace the center point is going to be the four elements and the element earth, as you know, is associated with the cube. So there is the earth cube or hexahedron. Um, air will be associated with the octahedron, water to an icosahedron, fire to a tetrahedron. And we talked about how in the Timaeus, because of certain features of the triangles that make up these three, they can alchemically turn into one another. They can't turn in with to earth. Earth can just be mixed with the three of those. And we also talked about how time and space measures are always linked. The spatial measurements are, using the Timaeus as, as our context, they are always perfect. So a circle is a perfect form. It has 360 degrees. A year is something always in motion. It's not perfect. It has 365 days. It's a little off. And we will, again, see equations of temporal and spatial measurements all through the hieroglyphic monad. Um, now, you know probably that there's a fifth element. And it is also in the Timaeus where you get the reference that it may be the shape of the universe, this fifth element associated to ether because it's the dodecahedron and it most closely approximates a sphere, which is the perfect form. You flip a circle into a sphere. By the way, these images come from our sponsor, Geometric Models. I want to thank them again for all their help in putting these videos together. I have links to their webpage and their Facebook group below. They make wonderful educational posters for those of you interested in sacred geometry and also some manipulables to help you create, for example, platonic solids, star mothers, things like that that you may have heard of in other contexts. So let's talk a little about though the dodecahedron and 12, it's made, you notice it's not made of triangles. It's made of 12 pentagons. Now you can cut up the pentagons and get triangles, which is another whole thing they talk about briefly in the, the Timaeus. But 12, the 12 pence in this perfect dodecahedron is what in this platonic view is the shape of the universe. I've been told by some that there are a few contemporary uh, scientific articles talking about the cosmos possibly being shaped like a dodecahedron um, in the last few years. That's kind of beyond my field of knowledge. I'll leave you to find that on your own. But in time measurements, we all know this today is common knowledge, right? 12 months in a year. We may know 12 signs in a zodiac. We number our clock faces if we still read them rather than a digital face with 12. And then it repeats. So we have 24 hours in a day, which is the number of theorems, which is of course, no accident. You kind of feel at times like you're in a numeric echo chamber as you go through the theorems. Number correspondences are never by accident. So what about seven, since we're in theorem seven? Seven, of course, is the number of days we have in a week. And the names of those days of the week, most of them are 
because of their correspondences to planets and not any planets. They're the seven classical planets used by the Greeks and Romans. So you remember in the Timaeus, when you have this perfect circle, which is actually a sphere, you have seven concentric circles, which are actually seven concentric spheres, spheres, which are the orbits of the seven classical planets. And those planets are gods and they are helping through reason, the highest faculty, bring order to the chaos that is the cosmos without reflection, without kind of mentation and reason exerted upon that chaos. And that brings us to theorem seven. So let's just read through it first, or at least I'm going to read through the first part of it and then explain a few things. So in theorem seven, D says, elements that are removed from their natural habitation and whose homogeneous parts are from thence dislocated will teach an experimenter that they are naturally restored to their places by means of straight lines. Accordingly, it will not seem absurd to, fill, to insist that the mystery of the four elements into which each primary substance can ultimately resolve is intimated by the four straight lines, these here, that project out from a unique point into contrary directions. All right, let me stop there. The natural habitations of the elements is where? It's the world of perfect form. So if we're looking at this, they've already been dislocated. Now, an experimenter, presumably someone in the world of becoming in the cosmos, not in the world of perfect form, because the wise craftsman was no experimenter. The wise craftsman was a creator. So, but an experimenter will learn that they're naturally restored to their places by means of straight lines, which must be these. Now, how are they going to be naturally restored to their places? First, we have to know what those places are, right? And in the Timaeus, there are very long sections about how do you, in the phenomenological world or the world of, of becoming that is constantly in motion, how do you even know what earth is or air or fire? How do you know what these elements are? Because they're all mixed up. They don't have a natural place in the world of becoming is my point. So you're restoring them to their perfection in that eternal world of forms. That's very important. And we'll come back to that idea. Also notice here that D writes out for and over here, you have it in numerical form. You remember the letter we talked about that he wrote to printer Silvius, where he, in effect, says, leave things the way I've written them out. If I've put a dot here, don't change it. If I have written out four, leave it the way I've written it out. Some things he puts in caps, sometimes small caps. I've tried to render that as much as possible in my slides here. So why is he writing out four? It's because it refers back to those four elements that we've talked about. He's not concerned now with the fifth element. He will be, and we'll have pentagrams and things like that implied later on, but now he's not interested in that. So they're capitalized because they're not integers. It's not one, two, three, four, although we will talk about one, two, three, four very quickly here, but they're referring to these four platonic solids. When you get down here, these four straight lines are things you can count. They're not necessarily referring to the four elements. They're a quaternary, and the four elements are a quaternary, and we will find some other quaternaries we found for right angles before. But do you see the difference there? It's important. When he writes a number out, it's some kind of transcendental, um, perfect idea to him. So if you are following along using the um, translation that Dr. Nancy Turner and I did that's out by Orboros Press, you have some footnotes in there to help you along, but I'll just um, give them to you here in case you don't have that. I've already talked about how notice when four is spelled out. Um, I want to talk next about what he means here by primary substance. In Latin, he uses a term elementata, which you can't directly translate and find one word in, in um, modern English. Sometimes it's mistranslated as element, but elementa is element, elementata is not. It's a term that is used by some people who, uh, who are writing in the Middle Ages about Plato or about Hermeticism. 
And it is the first substances you get when you start mixing these elements in the phenomenological world of becoming, the world that is always in motion. So the first mixture of earth and air would be a primary substance. Or if you mixed air and fire, rather than having one just change into the other, that would be an elementata and so on. Those of you here who are interested in these later spirit diaries and the so-called Enochian work, I'm sure see a parallel there with his great table of earth, which is broken into four elements. And those four elements are then broken into sub elements. So you get things like um, air of earth, air of fire, air of water, air of air. Those would be elementatas. And I have a separate uh, video on that below. When we get to contrary, Remember um, in the videos on the letter to King Maximilian, when we talked about his aphorisms to the Parisians, at the time that Dee was lecturing in Paris, which is not too long before he uh, is writing the Monas, Paracelsian medicine, which was from the Middle Ages, was enjoying a real renaissance, all puns intended. It was very in vogue among the students in Paris. And Opposites or contraries are a big notion in Paracelsian medicine. That is, the body is out of balance because you have too much of this, so you ingest the opposite and put your body back into balance to heal. D is considering this a healing symbol to, among other things, in the context we're using it now, it's to restore you to an understanding of the platonic state of the good and aspire towards it. He's writing it to Maximilian, so Maximilian can do that and be a wise philosopher king for Plato's Republic. And we've talked about these things earlier. Okay, let me read this second part here. This will be very important as we get to the concept of magical flux, which is either a brilliant sleight of hand or one of the most beautiful descriptions of why things are not perfect in this world that I have ever read and linking it all to the number seven. Okay, D says, here you will carefully note what the geometers teach. A line is produced from the outflowing of a point. Well, we had this when we displaced this point. Um, I'm gonna talk about why this symbol is different from the one on the previous page in a moment. But when we displaced this intersection point, and the four lines are flowing out from it. We'd think about that if the line were straight in geometry today as a ray. And using this same principle, we point out that this is also the case in our mechanical magic. What is his mechanical magic? Well, among other things, it's using a compass and straight edge to draw these forms. Because the lines indicating our elements are produced by the continuous fall of drops. Now, if these lines are the quaternary and they're indicating the elements, they are not those elements themselves, right? Because those only exist in the eternal world of forms. So there are quaternary representing those elements. And they're produced by the continuous fall of drops, which are like physical points moving as though they are flowing. Well, Euclid and D know or represent, just as we do in geometry today, that a line is produced by an infinite number of points, and so is a ray, and, and line that goes infinitely in one direction rather than two, and that, um, that's what he's referring to. But his Latin has a beautiful wordplay that you can't render in English. It's not just Dr. Turner and I that noticed that. C.H. Jostin noticed that back in 1964 in his translation. But what he doesn't notice is that, that how significant that wordplay is. So the outflowing and flowing here, fluxu, is playing upon the idea of drops of water in a river. It is also where we get the term flux. And the notion of a flux and a river is an incredibly important idea in the Timaeus. And not only the Timaeus, by the way. If you're a philosophy student and you have heard of the concept of um, Heraclitan flux, it's exactly the same thing. It's Heraclitus who comes up with this concept. And it's the idea that you can't step into the same river twice. In the world of becoming, things are constantly changing. Nothing is ever exactly the same as it was a moment before. And how would you measure that moment before anyway? All right, so we've gone through the words of the whole theorem. And just to remind you then, 
again, that the mystery of the four elements and how three of the four of them change into each other is a significant part of the Timaeus. We have the, the three acts done by the wise craftsman, the eternal world of being, the changing world of forms and the receptacle that mediates between them, uh, making our ternary. And then the four elements are the quaternary, Three plus four is seven. Oh, yeah, we're in the seventh theorem. And we know the earth can't change in anything, but it can be mixed with other things. Um, this is kind of at the heart of ancient Greek alchemy also, although I'm not talking about this as a text of physical alchemy. I've talked about elementata and how years later, when Dee and Kelly are scrying the spirit vision in their Enochian work, we encounter something that seems like it can be considered an elementata, even though it's coming from the angels or what D takes as angels. It is being filtered through the mind of two men who know the Monus Hieroglyphica very well. Now we're, let's go back to the idea of how a line is gonna restore those four elements to their places when we know that their place is in a world we can't see, the world of perfect forms. Okay, I'm gonna remind you of something else from theorem six told you that was that's pretty important for understanding theorem seven so in theorem six the lines go off in all four directions right and then they become part of two circles so this line goes off this way and joins this line and forms a circle this one goes off this way and joins this one and forms a circle intuitively if you're visualizing this you might realize the only way this can happen is if we are going from what we would today call Cartesian geometry, the geometry of, of square grids or cubic grids, depending on if it's 2D or 3D, into the world of spherical geometry. So spherical geometry and Cartesian geometry in a high school or college geometry class do not mix right? Because one has to do with the sphere and one has to do with either a cube or else a two-dimensional plane divided up into square grids. So he's trying to mesh these. Meshing those two things, if you collapse it down to 2D, is actually one of the reasons why the squaring of the circle was so important and one of the three classical problems of ancient Greek geometry. You flip it into 3D and you basically have the cubing of a sphere. And when we get to theorem 20, that's exactly what he's going to try to do, uh, is cube a sphere and think that he has succeeded, although modern mathematicians would disagree with him. Part of that has to do with magical flux, this concept we're talking about today. I will explain before this video is over. But all, there, are, there are neat things you can do if you make these circles. For one thing, it looks if it's kind of squished out like the symbol we get in mathematics for infinity. If you make them two perfect circles, they might even look like eyeglasses. Um, we learn in the Timaeus that since the sphere is the most perfect form, the skull, which is the part of the body most like a sphere, is the most sacred and of our senses. Eyes, which are two orbs, the sense organs most like a sphere, they're the most um, sacred of the senses, even though what you're contemplating is unseen, the eternal world. Um, and again, the reason I'm always flipping between 2 and 3D is because it is a concept very well known to D and built upon by D. This is the Pythagorean monad, the Pythagorean symbol of the universe. In the Timaeus, what happens is this circle, which is a sphere, is punctured. Remember the things we've talked about with Mercury, stillbone, uh, even the point of the astrological symbol Aries. It's punctured by at this point, and it fills with God stuff or the divine or consciousness or whatever it is that animates the entire universe where everything is alive. And this is a sphere, a perfect form. All right. So these two circles, if they are just touching at one point, you get some interesting things. You push them in a little, as you will do in later theorems, and you get a vesica piscus, a generative form generating through here. And what else is that? It's a lens. Oh, sight again is the most sacred of the of the senses and also think of Dee's interest in optics. All right, so we can do all of those things. We're gonna do something even simpler though and think about what we've been told about this rectilinear cross. Okay, so some review before we do that. 
one, two, three, four, and a tetractus. And all of the things that D would um, associate with that. I've talked about the Pythagorean monad symbol. Now I wanna briefly review the tetractus. Okay, remember here we have one, two, three, four, add them up and you get 10. You have 10 dots here total. Add up in any direction, one, two, three, four, you'll get 10. And you have 10 dots, it's a decad as we talked about before. The top is a monad, every monad is a higher order decad. When we're shifting and talking about the tree of life where there's 10 sephiroth, there will be some very convenient attributions you can make here. But we also can think of this whole thing as a monad, just like this point. A vesica, like I had on the last page, would be two that generates. The ternary, we've already talked about in the quaternary, um, and three and four equaling seven, seven classical planets, seven days in a week. So you have all this stuff um, jumbled around in this numeric echo chamber. Then we start looking at some of the fascinating properties of the number seven. It's the only prime number, for example, that precedes a cubic number. Eight in our next theorem is a cubic number, two to the third. And in our last video, we referred it to the center of a cube. Also, in the kind of just dice that we use a lot even now to play games, it also existed in D's time, you have this cubic dice and the opposite sides, if you add them up, always you always get seven, like six plus one, for example. Okay. So there's all kinds of unusual properties you can ascribe the number seven, including its association with the heptagon over here. Now, if you're doing classical Greek geometry with the compass and straight edge, a heptagon's really difficult to draw with a compass and straight edge. It can't easily be done. D will come up with a very complex way later using his monad glyph as a kind of uh, drafting tool to draw one of these things. And with the tips of the horn. It's kind of cool, but I'm, we're getting, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So it can't easily be drawn. It also, you can't tile heptagons together in the same way you can with, say, this n-gon, if this is a trigon or a triangle. Okay, you can stack triangles together and fill two-dimensional space without any spaces in between. Can't do that with a heptagon. Um, it's it's got lots of other fascinating properties. You can look it up, but seven is sort of such a different number that it becomes associated, it becomes a mystical number. So let's collapse the cube down to a monad and then we'll talk a little bit more about seven as a mystical number. Let's get my monad symbol back here. There it is. Okay, so remember when in the Timaeus, the world is formed by the wise craftsman. You get a, a puncture in this perfect sphere. It's filled with God stuff. And then it gives worth to the, birth to the world of forms. So this is representing the world of perfect forms. And we've dislocated a point here. What if we dislocate this whole thing and put it on top of that little head or this symbol down here? Then what you would have is rather than this influx of God stuff filling this spinning sphere, you would have sort of the moment after when it makes these four forms. And of course, also the dodecahedron, which is most closely associated with the sphere. So it's outside and all around all the others. Okay, so that's what happens when elements that are removed from their natural habitations, will they are naturally restored by means of straight lines. They come through here, and while we can't maybe figure out how much of this uh, space up here is air and how much is water, the more we contemplate upon the perfect form, the more that we will start to know that if you are following this way of thinking from the Timaeus. So the entrance for a soul the whole soul of the rushing cosmos that's always in motion is that point. Where if we have dislocated this point and it's that one, or we put this cross up here, then you have the rushing in of the cosmos that takes the form of the four elements. Okay, so that's then why the four elements are flowing like lines. They're representing the influx of the four elements. Okay, let's talk about some other things that will bring us back to the number seven. And while it may not seem like we're almost done, we actually are. 
magically, we will suddenly be almost finished. To do this, I have to show you some things in the original Latin. So remember back when we talked about theorem one, which we have here in Latin, I talked about how when D writes line in Latin, he usually just writes recta. But the first time he writes about line in theorem one, he says lineum rectum. So after that, when he says just recta or rectum, he is using a kind of shorthand because that word can mean straight, a straight edge, a straight line, morally straight or upright or full of rectitude and aspiring back up to the one. It can also mean a right angle, like in our rectilinear cross. But look what happens over here in theorem seven. Down here, when he is talking about the line produced from an outflowing of a point, he just says lineum. Why would that be? That's because it's not a straight line. We have looked at it in his glyph that is supposed to help restore things to their perfect state of oneness as straight lines. But in this world, the line can't ever be straight. It's produced by a continuous fall of drops, which are like physical points. But if you think of them as being like a river, like they would be in the work of Heraclitus from where you get the idea of flux and like it is in the Timaeus um, later, these drops are flowing into a river. Have you ever seen a straight river? I mean, even if it looks straight, it's not going to be perfectly straight. That's an impossible thing. The river is always in flux. Hence that famous classical saying, you can't step into the same river twice. So not only do you get with the outflowing of a point and physical points that are flowing, that would be on the next page in this translation, um, that it's a beautiful wordplay and it's very poetic. It's also directly, directly, yes, directly referring you to the Timaeus. And in the Timaeus, there is an incredible drawing upon the concept of Heracliton flux. So um, there are, by the way, all kinds of things I could talk about here, but I'm not just in the interest of time. Like this fall of drops could be a do if you are analyzing this in terms of physical alchemy. Um, a do, you get the same concept in uh, like Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream um, a generation later, but uh, I'm not going to go into detail about that and physical alchemy. Maybe someday later I will, but not now. Also, typographical things in the original Latin that there was no way to render in translation. I'm not really talking about like when theorem one, when the, the letters at the bottom of the page that let the printer know that it's they have the pages in the right order because they will link to the first words at the top of the next page, sometimes seem significant. Like the, or, uh, well, the next thing is going to be the second theorem, but it looks like part of the Greek word for God, even though it's just a printer's mark. And he'll do something over here. Um, we can't separate a point. This, we're in theorem seven, of course, we're missing all the text between. This is going to be puncti, a point. So you can't separate a point, right? It's zero dimensions. Well, you don't even separate it in the printing process. Here it is, puncti. And then the T will continue up here at the top. I don't know. I think that kind of stuff is a lot of fun. It can get tedious to many people. So we'll go on. And let's hook back to what I said about the problem of the receptacle in Plato's Timaeus. In the Timaeus, Plato or Timaeus as written about by Plato resolves this with the idea of the phenomenological world, the world of becoming that is always in motion, being like a river. It's in constant flux. Again, you can't step in the same river twice. Here's Plato with the Timaeus, according to the painter Raphael. You've seen this painting many times before. Um, and I thought, since I'm saying how much people have talked about the Timaeus and the receptacle and how there are whole critical conferences on these, I thought I'd just give you an idea of the sort of papers that come out. You get something like this one, Matter and Flux in Plato's Timaeus. You go to Google Scholar and just type in Flux and Timaeus and you will draw up a huge number of articles. It's something that those of you who are scholars can explore. Um, one of the things I pulled up was a, a uh, 
award-winning undergraduate essay talking about the concept of flux in Plato's Timaeus. So worlds to explore there if you want to. I'm just going to wrap things up here, though, and tell you how they're setting up what we're doing next. Remember the time and space measures are always linked. The spatial measures are perfect. The temporal ones aren't. These five forms are perfect. But in the world of becoming, we aren't even sure what one looks like unless we're able to visualize. We visualize with that cross that these four forms are coming in, and then we try to place them. Um, Septenaries, things having to do with the number seven, are among the hardest things to visualize. Now, you can just look at that as, I don't know, like with the squaring of the circle, you can't do it perfectly because pi is an uh, irrational number. And so in modern math, one would say, well, you cannot square a circle you have to use a fractional equivalent so you just can't do it and because the fractional equivalent is not exact enough it's just kind of slop because it uses this number you know 3.1416 whatever yeah the other way of looking at that though is as something mystical that it's very mystical that the radius of a circle is always pi r squared for uh, or uh, well, I won't uh, attempt to lecture in math, but it can be a very mystical thing. So consider these forms in terms of the septenary. You will find every uh, example of the ternaries, quaternaries, octads, things we've talked about, except a septenary here, won't you? Could you? Can you think of one of these that has seven anything, seven edges, seven faces, seven vertices? No, there's no septenaries here. But seven is ubiquitous in time measurements. Would that not mean if you were looking at seven as a mystical thing rather than sort of mathematical slop that it is so unusual it is worth contemplating and it becomes a sign of the world itself in flux. You're trying to return to these perfect forms, but you live in a constantly changing world of flux. Just a, a quick digression, by the way, for those of you interested in Dee's later work, Seven will obsess Dee for most of his lifetime. He will often associate sevens with fives for reasons that actually we'll get to in later theorems. But some of you who uh, do Enochian work will recognize this as the outline of his seal of truth of God or Sigelum de Emet. It's the first item in his so-called Enochian corpus, and it's part of the Heptarchia, yeah, seven, Heptarchia mystica. Oh, did we talk about seven as mystic? Yes, we did. And his mysterious working in uh, Prague with Kelly and, and others in 1588 is it? heptagonal working for some reason. So if you look at the seal of truth, what do you have? A perfect circle here broken up. Then you have a heptagon. In the middle, you've got a pentagon. Here is a hexagon. And what is this stylized thing going on around here? Count it up. It is, it's a heptagon, but the way it is drawn is suggesting that it is something that is 3D, like the orbits of the planets, perhaps. So the idea is that uh, this is something that D will work at for the rest of his life. I did miss a, a point in talking about seven. I talked about why this glyph, um, this is the one that I've used the most, but we had that stylized glyph, remember, where there were two lines where the horn was kind of going under the top. When you get to theorem 23, D will tell you that once you understand the principles behind how he's taking apart and putting together this symbol, that it's fine to make it pretty. And he talks about some ways that you can make it pretty. Um, but making it pretty without understanding the pure principle behind it is not something you should do. OK, so skipped over that point, bringing it in now. That's pretty much all I'm going to have to say about theorem seven. So your homework for theorem eight is just relax, go over this stuff and get ready for a very easy theorem. Theorem eight is where John D is going to show you, among other things, a reason why he thinks that Latin is a sacred language and the Roman alphabet a sacred alphabet, like the Hebrew alphabet implicitly, which creates the universe in the Sefer Yetzirah. Okay, folks, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for joining us.